coming up next on Legislative Review. The one that happened in Seattle, uh, that collapsed in Seattle last spring, killed four people, including two members of the public. Tower crane teardowns get top scrutiny. This is a pivotal moment in history to heal our communities. Both chambers remember Dr. Martin Luther King's sacrifice. And when he gave his life to the cause of civil rights, social justice, for all of us, his ideas and legacy lived on. I'm not asking you to eliminate guns. Just pass a common sense gun law that helps prevent mass, mass shootings. And high capacity magazines earn a public hearing in the Senate. Hello, I'm Troy Kirby with Legislative Review for January 20th, covering the 2020 legislative session. Today's episode has hearings on crane teardowns, high capacity magazines, and both chambers honoring Dr. Martin Luther King's sacrifice. The Senate Labor and Commerce Committee hearing is now in session. The Senate Labor and Commerce Committee met January 20th, discussing Senate Bill 6171, which regulates tower crane disassembly, requiring labor and industries to be on site when a crane is taken down. Senator Karen Kaiser advocated for the bill in response to the April 27, 2019 crane collapse in Seattle. We added an, a new... Um, a new fine in this bill that applies when there is a fatality with tower cranes. Tower cranes go up in urban areas for the most part, and so they have impact on the public. And the one that happened in Seattle, uh, that collapsed in Seattle last spring, killed four people, including two members of the public. Iron workers, Local 86, supported the bill as a safety measure for their workers. What we support specifically are uh, any laws or uh, policies that improve the safeties on all the safety of all projects in order to be able to send people home safely uh, to their families at the end of each day. Critics of the bill said the crane collapse was due to existing rules not being followed. What has happened is we believe those statutes that are on the books today as Senator Braun and Senator King outlined worked in the case. I mean, we obviously are very, we're concerned about the accident and don't want to see that happen at any time, but rules were broken, citations were issued. Now, whether we agree that they were high enough, but the department issued penalties, and so what the statutes that were on the books worked, in our opinion. A concern was how cumbersome it would be on the construction industry to have LNI present during a crane teardown. What if the department doesn't um, receive the 48-hour notice or they can't comply with the 48-hour notice? The notice has been provided, but now the crane uh, they tell the crane supplier that they don't have manpower available. You have many levels of companies involved in different things from mobilizing mobile cranes to street closures to technicians to everything and simply just saying that we have to reschedule it because the department can't adapt or, or serve the need is kind of concerning. Um, same thing in an emergency situation, uh, say there's a structural deficiency with the foundation, it demands immediate action where it's, uh, do we have to wait 48 hours before we can disassemble the crane or can we proceed immediately? How would situations like that be resolved? Um, what authority does the department, the department have on site? Will they have the authority to stop work immediately? Will they be in charge of the erection crew? Will they be in charge of the situation? Um, um, how will the department determine if the procedures are followed? Are they going to receive training? Uh, are they going to be familiar with every single model and manufacturer of tower crane and all of their procedures and what step-by-step -step is supposed to be done? Um, and again, the same thing. Where is the department going to get the inspectors to enforce this? Uh, is it in the intent of the department to hire from industry and take away some of our best trained professionals that we put a lot of effort in training for years and years and years. Uh, in fact, just this morning before this meeting, I was notified that the department has made a job offer to one of my service technicians to come to work for him, and that particular service technician does not have a background in tower cranes. His primary background is in the installation and um, operation and maintenance of external elevators. So that's a real concern for us. This is a pivotal moment in history to heal our communities and create a more perfect union. 
Thank you. Both chambers on January 20th honored Dr. Martin Luther King's sacrifice on the House and Senate floors. Dr. King answered that question not just with deeds and words, but with action, collaborative action. When they threw him in a Birmingham jail, he wrote letters that inspired America. And when he gave his life to the cause of civil rights, social justice, for all of us, his ideas and legacy lived on. It means that we've got to stay together. We've got to stay together and maintain unity. You know, whenever Pharaoh wanted to prolong the period of slavery in Egypt, he had a familiar formula for doing it. What was that? He kept the slaves fighting among themselves. Because whenever slaves get together, uh, that's the beginning of getting out of slavery. Uh, we are going to be hearing a set of controversial bills today. The Senate Law and Justice Committee heard public testimony on Senate Bill 6077, which would ban high capacity magazines that hold 10 rounds or more. Several witnesses advocated for the bill, including the families of shootings in Parkland, Florida and Las Vegas, Nevada. But on Valentine's Day 2018, a former student with an AR-15 and high-capacity magazines quickly ended Carmen's dreams. Carmen's shooter was able to kill 17 students and staff and win 17 more within a matter of seconds. Carrying 300 rounds of ammunition, he hoped to carry out his dream, committing a mass school shooting. In under two minutes, he was able to unpack his assault rifle, load his magazines, and shoot up the first floor. He shot 24, resulting in 11 killed and 13 wounded. Carmen was fatally shot four times while trying to hide in her AP psychology class on that first floor. It's only a question of when, not if, another mass shooting will occur. Our current gun laws make mass shootings inevitable. And for our family, the inevitable occurred on October 1 in Las Vegas. It could have been prevented. Without assault weapons and high capacity magazines, I believe our daughter would be alive today. I beg you to please pass SB 6077. I'm not asking you to eliminate guns. Just pass a common sense gun law that helps prevent mass, mass shootings. Critics of the bill said that the high-capacity magazines were beneficial when defending against more than one attacker. I trained a student some years ago who asked me not to use her name, who had survived a home invasion, which three men armed with shotguns overpowered her and her family and took most of her things. She decided she didn't want to be a victim. The Force Science Institute, which studies the uses of force principally amongst police officers, shows that the rate with which trained people, even trained people, hit what they are shooting at is roughly 39%. Firearms that hold more than 10 shots of ammunition are disproportionately more useful for somebody who's defending themselves alone against multiple assailants. That makes that particular firearm a safer choice for an entire segment of society. So this bill dangerously takes away the safest personal protection op option for thousands of women, elderly and disabled. What's common sense about that? House Bill 2401 deals with the use of AI on job applicants. Meanwhile, in the House Committee on Labor and the Workplace, members heard about artificial intelligence in job interviews on January 20th. House Bill 2401 creates employer requirements for usage of artificial intelligence on applicant videos and restricts sharing of the applicant videos. It is apparently a new thing that those of us old as dirt don't know some jobs uh, uh, are, are interviewed for by robots. Uh, you submit a video, they use artificial intelligence, they use some facial recognition technology. Um, and based on how your vocabulary is, uh, how you hold yourself, what your face looks like, is whether you make the cut or not to move on to the next piece. There's certainly some opportunity here. Humans have bias in all of their um, uh, interactions with humans as well. So there's opportunity here, but um, we don't know how these decisions are being made in the job context or with all of these AI systems. And so the bill before you offers us uh, a little bit of an uh, opportunity to have a discussion about 
how much we want these systems to be in place um, for those and whether or not people can opt out, whether people or not can uh, have that information deleted, which is becoming standard and we're certainly discussing it here in Washington State this year. A recent Washington Post article had been shared with the committee in advance about the growth of AI in job interviews. Where is this currently being used? Do you know, I read the article and I'm looking to see if there's other places that we could see the good and the bad at the same time to try to assess what would be best for Washington State. Well, um, uh, my recollection is that it's sort of being used a little bit of all over the place. We're seeing some nonprofits and for-profits using it, um, and there are a few companies doing this. But I, I think the, the big piece is about setting the standard for how these interviews are done and what's the role. So um, uh, I'm sure it's being done here in Washington State. I, I couldn't tell you exactly who is using it. Um, most of it's just a private service. You would engage them to interview a bunch of college students. Uh, in some ways, it's very efficient. In some ways, it's a great way of culling out folks who are just trying to maybe check the box on job interviews for their parents you know, or something like that. Uh, it, it's really tough with so much information, but we also need to make sure that it's not reinforcing biases and that it's moving us in the right direction. Thank you for watching Legislative Review for January 20th, covering the 2020 legislative session. Follow us digitally on Facebook and Twitter or watch Legislative Review on TVW Nightly at 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. with a weekend review show on Friday and the weekend. I'm your host, Troy Kirby.